right, uh, thanks for the introduction and for the invitation. All right, so um, so so let me start by motivating um my title. All right, so um, so I guess in rational geometry, there's a well-known analog, a local global analog. Um, between singularities and bundle varieties. So on the local side, what we have um, are the KLT singularities, so-called KLT singularities. While on the global side, we have the bundle varieties. You see this analog, for instance, if you take a funnel variety and consider the corn over it, uh, you will get a KLT singularity. So that's one of the most important example of KLT singularity, which will be the corn over final varieties. And more generally, you can take an orbital corn, meaning that the polarization is not a Cartier divisor, but only a Q line bundle. Okay, so you can also take an orbital corn. And in some sense, um, one way to define KLT singularity is to say that they consist of the class of orbital cone over final varieties plus their deformations. Okay, so, but if you want to be more precise, it should be Q-Gonstein deformations. But that's the picture. All right, so um, now um, on the final side, um, there has been many progress on their boundedness. So for instance, um, um, so you know many boundaries with that. So, for instance, Berka has shown that. Um, well, he has proved the BAB conjecture, meaning that um, final varieties um, whose um, log discrepancies bounded from below by some positive number, they belong to a bounded family. Um, a more recent one, um, due to Jiang. Um, Originally due to Jiang and then later reproved by um, Chiang and myself. Maybe let me state it separately. Um, and that has more to do with the um, case stability context. Is that um, if I consider um, final varieties, uh, case semi stable final varieties, varieties. With a fixed dimension um, and volume lower bound. Okay, so, volume is just the self intersection of the anti canonical. Okay, so, of course, this is bigger than zero. Um, then, this varieties belong to a bounded family as well. All right, so, um, so then you might ask, all right, so. Um, we know so many boundedness results about final varieties. Can we also say something about the boundedness of singularities through this local and global analogy? Um, and one good news for good for us. Well, um, it's not really news yet, but um, may I ask about the theorem? Oh, sorry, question. Uh, may I ask about the theorem? Sorry, is it uh, independent of BAB or so? Uh, Jiang's proof uses BAB. Um, but then later we gave a proof that um, that does not need BAB. Mm -hmm. But okay. still it needs some um, boundedness results, for instance, the one proven by Hayton, McKernan, and Shui on the Betty refs conjecture, mm -hmm. but not on the full BAB. All right, so um so one thing that seems good for us in the single in the local case is that there is a stable degeneration conjecture. Um, Due to uh, Shuli um, and Chenyang. And so I'm not going to state the full conjecture, but basically, um, the slogan of this conjecture is that every KLT singularity is semi stable. Well, K semi stable. Um, so the precise version of the conjecture says that um, there is a normalized volume function on a singularity. And if, it, if you take the minimizer of that normalized volume function, it's going to induce 
uh, the generation of the KLT singularity to an orbifold cone over some log final object. Okay, so if you think about um, reversing this direction, um, so every KLT singularity can be deformed by taking some k semi stable cone. Right, so that's the, um, the essence of this picture. Right, so that means um, we might be able to expect a boundedness result of um, KLT singularities in the spirit of this theorem I just stated. Okay, so, so every KLT singularity is case and stable, so we don't have to worry about the stability context. So all we have to do is to find some numerical invariant and get a boundedness. So that would be the part of the goal of this talk. Okay, um, um, so let me um, now, um, so, okay, so, so the rough question is, um, we would like to get boundedness of KLT singularities now that we expect all of them to be case semi stable um, via some numerical invariant. All right, so, um, so this would certainly be the analogy with the global one, but there are two issues we have to resolve first. So the first issue is that um, we need to be very careful about what mountainous means in the local context, because um, um, if you look at general singularities, um, so a KLT singularity, in fact, can have an infinite dimensional deformation space. So what do we mean by bounded in this case, right? So, um, if you want, if you would like a concrete example, for instance, I can take um, this threefold. So x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals zero inside C four. Oh, so I have to say everything I'm going to mention is over the complex numbers. All right, so, um, so this singularity is just the cone over a singular quadrant. Um, and as you deform it, you can add the fourth variable. So I only use three variables to define this equation, but you can certainly add the fourth one, which I named W. Okay, so. But then you see that the deformation space is essentially um, infinite dimensional because it's the polynomial ring in one variable. Okay, so, so then, then we get an infinite dimensional deformation space. So what should we do? Well, so, um, so maybe the reason we get this um, problem um, comes from this deformation step, right? So, um, so I'm going to declare that, um, that a family of singularities is bounded if um, that comes from deforming a bounded family of cone singularities. Okay, so in some sense, there's a um, straightforward way to fix this issue. Right, so, so I'm going to introduce, um, so instead of boundedness, let me introduce this notion of special boundedness. which uh, um, roughly is going to say that, um, uh, so um, it's um, a bounded family uh, of um, singularities, of con singularities. Uh, plus their deformations. So that's what we mean by bounded in this case. Uh, but let me make it a little bit more precise so that um, we have a common ground to um, step on. Okay, so, um, so let me first um, elaborate what's, okay, so let me first make it precise what's a family of singularities. So for us, a family of singularities would be, well, so it's going to be a family, right? So X over some base. And so a singularity has a distinguished point, close point, so it has to have a section. Um, and, and I want this to be like, um, all right, so again, if I didn't forget to mention all the singularities in this talk will be KLT. Um, 
right? So it has to satisfy, for instance, every fiber is a KLT singularity. And there's a technical condition that, um, so the relative canonical is Q constant so that we can actually define KLT. And once we have this condition, um, I just want uh, um, the fibers uh, to be KLT. Okay, so this would be a family of singularities for us. And for special boundedness, I would like to say that every singularity in this family, they degenerate to a con singularity. So a con singularity has a GM action. So, um, so, and I also want this degeneration to be isotrivial, okay? So, because I don't want to involve other objects in this process. So, um, so a better way to say, to do this is to take a GM equivariant degeneration. So that's what I would call a special degeneration. So this would be a family um, of singularities as above. Um, with a section, but it also has carries the GM action that commutes with the usual GM action on the base. Um, and then there will be a generic fiber. Um, and there will be a special fiber over zero. So, so then this is an isotrivial family um, with generic fiber X and special fiber X zero. And I'm going to call this process a special degeneration from X to X U. Right, so, and then finally, when I say special boundedness, um, so that means so a family of singularities, KLT singularities is um, specially bounded. If um, there exists a bounded family, of um, KLT singularities um, such that um, any singularity in the given family, well, so maybe call, give names to this family, right? So maybe the first one is uh, a set of singularities maybe, okay? So the set S of um, singularities, especially bounded if I can find a bounded family um, such that every singularity in S um, specially degenerate to a member of, um, of this family over P. Right, so hopefully this makes the concept of special boundedness more precise. And as I said at the beginning, um, the real meaning of this is that I can it generate a given set to a bounded family of con singularities. And for instance, uh, uh, in the example you gave just before mm -hmm. the definition, mm -hmm. uh, so, so you, you have this infinite dimensional deformation family where yep. you add F of W, yep. Uh, yep. but uh, uh, do I get it right that it's specially bounded and the family is just uh, consists of a single a single member? So yeah, so the family is this single member. Mm -hmm. And then, um, well, maybe this one plus the, the smooth point. Okay, so um, so this deformation can also give you a smooth point. Um, yeah, plus a smooth point, yeah. Yeah, um, but no, if this F is um, have um, all the multiplicity at least one, then you can consider the GM action that gives W a positive weight. And then as you specialize, the, the part that involves W disappears. So the central fiber of this special degeneration is either this um, corner of a singular quadric or this plus the constant, and that would be the smooth one. And one more question. Uh... Oh, no, no, I think yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, so, right. So are there, are there more questions about, at this point? All right, so, so then we'll agree that this is the um, boundedness notion that we'll use. Now coming back to the question, um, there's a second subtlety, which is, um, right, so then what would be the numerical invariant that we should specify? And of course, we would like to specify a numerical invariant that's an analog of the volume of a final variety in the global case. 
Okay, so definitely not the minimal log discrepancy at this moment. So fortunately, there's there is such an invariant um, that was introduced by Shirley. Uh, well, I guess seven years ago already, um, and it's called the local volume of a singularity. So let me um, first give the definition. Um, Right, so from now on, let me fix the singularity. So, so X is the singular point, the closed point. So, um, so I guess the basic object in this definition will always be divisors over the singularity. So, so these are, um, so these are prime divisors on the rational models of the variety X that maps to the closed point. Okay, so for instance, you can take Y to be a rock resolution and then E is the prime divisor um, on Y whose image is X. Okay, so, um, so associated to these divisors, there are several in classical invariant. For instance, one that appears so much in directional geometry is the log discrepancy. Right? So again, the singularity is KLG just to start um, with. Okay, so then we can define the log discrepancy and this is just one plus the order of vanishing along E of the relative canonical. Um, another one is the volume of this divisor, uh, well, considered as a divisorial valuation, maybe. Okay, so, but it can be defined as follows. So, um, right, so um, I'm going to look at um, the co length of the valuation I do, which is the push forward, right? So, the map is called pi. Uh, of minus and e, right? So basically, I'm looking at functions whose vanishing order is at least m along this chosen divisor. Okay, so that gives me an ideal on x supported on this singular point. So the co length will um, increase with m, and it increases of order m to the n if n is the dimension of x. So if I normalize it, I get a leading coefficient, right? So which means I'm taking the limit as m goes to infinity. Um, it turns out that this limit exists, but if you are worried, then you can take a limb soup. Okay, so, so this limit is called the volume of this divide. Uh, there should be length somewhere, right? So all right, so right, so let me um, first write limb soup, but actually it was shown by, I guess, um uh, maybe. I let us felt space um, that it's actually a limit using Alcumcoff bodies, basically. I think you can also show that. Yeah, but just to be safe, let's write limb soup. But, um, so you, 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 your uh, numerator is a sheep. It's it's not an integer. You you should put length somewhere. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, length. I'm looking at the co-length of this um, of this idea. Thanks. Right, so we get these two um, classical invariant. And then, um, so truly define the local volume of the singularity as follows. So the notation is volume hat of the singularity. Um, so, so we look at the infimum of all prime divisors um, um, over the singularity. And then, I normalize the volume of that divisor using this multiplicity to the diamond to the power n, n is the dimension. Okay, and then I take the input. Right, so that's the literal definition. But let me remark that the, so the reason he makes this choice, right? So the reason he normalized it using this power is because um so both this log discrepancy and the volume they extend uh, to the space of valuations. Right, so a divisor gives a divisorial valuation. And for valuations, um, this, this product is invariant under scaling. So, um, so that's why he chose this particular power. Right? So basically the log discrepancy is linear, but the volume is really like, um, like a, like a volume. So it's um, like something to the power n or minus n. Okay, so that's why you need to choose that 
um, exponent. All right, so, so this gives an invariant of the singularity. Um, but if you haven't seen this before, maybe it's better if I give some properties and examples first. Okay, so, um, so, right, so examples and properties. So first of all, it was shown by Shirley uh, that um, this invariant is always positive uh, as long as the KLT is singularity. Okay, so it's not a trivial invariant. Um, and then you might ask, okay, so what are the numbers? So for instance, if X is a smooth point, Then um, one can show that the local volume of a smooth point um, is exactly n to the n, where um, the infimum is given by the ordinary blob. Right. So for the ordinary blob, this is one, um, and because that's exactly, for instance, if you take the ordinary blob, this is given by the multiplicity of the singularity, and then the log discrepancy of the ordinary blob is n. Okay, so I get n to the n. And in general, I mean, general means that this, we get some other singularities. For other singularities, um, the volume is at most n to the n. And with equality, um, if and only if it is smooth. All right, so, um, so this, this is a non trivial result um, by. Uh, uh, Chen Liu, who's going to speak next, um, and Chen Yang. Right, so that means um, it's really measuring the singularities, right? So the smooth point has the largest volume, and then as you increase the singularity, it get smaller and smaller. At least that's expected. Okay, so, so another example, um, which is again a non trivial calculation uh, by uh, Shirley and Chen Yang, is that. Um, so if you look at a quotient singularity, then as you might expect, um, the volume should be divided by the order of the group that you take the quotient. And that's actually the case. Okay, so in this case, the volume is n to the n over g. And in fact, um, there is a finite degree formula um, that when you take proven by myself and Chuyang, that if you take the quotient of a singularity, then the volume also divide, gets divided by the order of the, uh, well, quadrata quotient. All right, so, so that gives some, um, maybe give some sense of how this singularities behave. Um, another property I would like to mention is that, so, so in some sense, this invariant- um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in the previous example, does it matter if G is in SL or in GL? Uh, no, it doesn't matter, but you have, it has to be like a, that's, does not contain those um, quality reflections, right? So uh -huh. I, I want the quotient to be quadrata. That's the only condition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, All right, so, um, so, one more thing I want to remark is that, so I guess maybe some people are more familiar with a more classical invariant called the minimal log discrepancy, right? So, uh, so this is defined as the infimum, again, um, over all divisors over the singularity of just the log discrepancy itself. So it turns out that I can compare the local volume with the minimal log discrepancy. And in some sense, the local volume is finer than this. So it was shown by, uh, again, so Shirley, Yuchen, Chen Yang, that um, the minimal log discrepancy is always bounded from below by um, the local volume up to a dimensional constant. So local volume over n to the n. Okay, so um, but in general, this this is quite strict. So um, so for instance, if you just look at AD singularities, the minimal log discrepancy of course is one. Right? AD surface singularities, um, but the local volume because they are quotient singularities, they really involve the order of the the local fundamental group. 
So as if you if you put the lower threshold on the local volume, um, you only get finitely many AD singularities instead of all of them. Okay, so in this sense, the local volume becomes a little bit finer than the minimal log discrepancy. Um, and one last thing. Um, Just is that, uh, oh, yes. ask about the third property. And yeah. uh, in the third property uh, about the quotient singularity, yes. isn't it important that we take a quotient of smooth point? Uh, I mean, that suppose that you have some singularity and then uh -huh. you take a further quotient by a finite group. Uh -huh. Do you have, uh, uh, do you know a relation between? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, I, I didn't write it down, but, uh, but let, let, me, let me write it down. Um, so I just said in words. Um, so, so the more general phenomenon that was proven by uh, Chen Yang and myself um, is that, um, so if you take um, a singularity X that has a G action, a finite group action, um, and then you look at um, its quotient. Um, well, so maybe I should put X bar and then X mod G, then the volume is divided by the order of G. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so this X mod, this quotient has to be quasi eta, uh, but otherwise um, that's always true. Yeah, so, so this also implies um, the quotient theory statement, but uh, there's a separate proof for that. All right, so uh, what's the last thing I want to say? Um, right, so um, so to make context with the um, the global statement, right? So so how is this volume related to the global volume of the final variety? Well, so um, if I take a, a cone singularity, let's say X is the cone over a K semi-stable final variety. Okay, so this this is very important. It has to be K semi-stable. Then um, it was shown by uh, Chile that uh, um, the local volume of this con singularity is exactly the volume of the final variety. So there are two things that's important. So it has to be a case semi stable final. And when you take the coin, it has to be anti canonically polarized. Then I get this number. Right. But in general, um, even for con singularities, um, this volume will be slightly different. Okay. Uh, so in, uh, in some sense, this local volume is a combination of the semi-stable part of the singularity and the global volume of um, this final variety. Okay. So it's a mixture. Okay. Uh, here, so, uh, sorry, here, N is what? Is it dimensional? N is the dimension, dimension of the N is the dimension of B. So oh, I'm taking the, the volume of the final variety. V is a final. Okay, so this is also the volume of the final variety. <clears throat> All right, so um so I think that's what I want to say about this um, invariant. So now coming back to the original boundedness question. Um so now we have the correct notion, well, hopefully correct notion of boundedness and a candidate for this numerical invariant. So a full block conjecture in this field, um, um, it was motivated by the boundedness result for case semi-stable funnels is that, so if I fix the dimension and- Sorry, uh, and if in the previous case, you replace minus KV by, its, by some fraction, uh, do, do, do you have something similar? In the previous case. Uh, CP of V minus KV divided by some integer. <clears throat> uh, right, so if you take a different polarization, then you have to multiply it by, you know, so what's the, like the relation between minus K and, and the polarization. So that factor is going to come in the front. So, so for instance, if you take uh, V to be projective space and minus hyperplane, then what do you get? So then, um, so, right, so, uh, let me see. So, um, 
So in general, if you take a different polarization, let me continue just uh, below this line. Uh, so in general, if you take a different polarization, but still um, k semi stable, mm -hmm. um, then if minus kv is like a q times l, um, then this local volume is q times um, again the volume of the polar of the k semi stable final variety. So for instance, for the projective space, uh, so v is the projective space of smaller dimension. Um, minus k is so the final index is n, so it's n times the hyperplane class. So the volume is n times the volume of the projective space, which is another n to the n minus one. So we get the same number as before. Right, so that's the slight difference. Mm -hmm. yeah, but if the base is not k semi stable, we don't know what to say. And as I said at the very beginning, so the stable this degeneration conjecture really is saying that um, if I take the minimizer of this um, um, of this infimum, right? So this infimum is in general not a minimum, but it's a minimum in the space of valuations, and that valuation will tell you where is the case semi stable problem. So usually the singularity is not a consingularity, and even for consingularity, that minimizer would be um, somewhere else. Okay, but let me um, don't go too much into that direction. All right. So um, so for the conjecture, let me finish the statement. So I need to fix the dimension and also a positive number, which will be the threshold for the local volume. Okay, so the conjecture says that the set of um, KLT singularities with this dimension and local volume bounded below from below by this V, right? Maybe let me call it epsilon because I think I used epsilon in my notes. Yes. Um, okay, so then this set is specially bounded. So that's the thing. Now, uh, again, let me make some immediate remarks on this conjecture. So the first remark is that, right, so I say that this conjecture in one direction, and the reason is that the reverse direction is always true, meaning that, um, so if you have a family of specially bounded, well, not a family, uh, a collection of fam singularities that are specially bounded, then, um, their local volume is always bounded from below by some fixed constant. And the reason is that, um, is, uh, maybe as you can expect, so this local volume has some further prop um, nice properties. Um, so first of all, it's lower semi-continuous in families. And moreover, in the bounded family, it's so point one is always positive, but if you have a bounded family, then there is a, so the infimum is, is not zero. Okay, so, so it's always positive in bounded family. So there's a non-trivial lower bound. And this was proven by Bloom and Liu. Right, so in particular, if I take a specially bounded collection, right, so, that comes from deforming a bounded family. So in that bounded family, there is always the lower bound, but because it's lower semi-continuous, when you deform it, that lower bound stays there. Okay, so, so that gives this direction. However, um, now this gives something non-trivial already, because, um, so the local volume is certainly not the only invariant that, um, that has these properties. I mean, lower semi-continuity and positivity in bounded family. So another such invariant that's most classical is the log canonical threshold. So, so also have this property. Okay. 
And that means now if I take, if I fix this to numbers, that means the set of singularities with this dimension and lower bound of the local volume, because we expect them to be specially bounded, there should also be a lower bound of their log canonical threshold that depend on this n and epsilon. And of course, um, if I want to take log canonical threshold, I need to introduce an extra divisor. So let me just say that. Um, so so far, I um, I introduce every object using just a, a singularity, but basically everything I just said and um, carry over to the case of KLT pairs. Okay, so um, so for KLT pairs, um, now I can look at um, the the log canonical threshold with respect to the ambient the boundary divisor. Okay, so then in this context, the conjecture implies the following according to what I just um, explained that um, if I look at the set of KLT pairs um, whose local volume is bounded from below by some constant, non positive constant, then um, oops, let me say the conjecture implies this statement that um, then, uh, oh, and and I also need the boundary dividers to be Q Cartier so that I can take a um, log canonical threshold. So then we should expect the log canonical threshold um, at this singular point. Um, uh, sorry, no for the X. Uh, to be bounded from below by some constant that only depend on the dimension and this X. Again, this is positive. Right, so this LCD stands for log canonical threshold, whatever that means. Right, so um, right, so as I said, um, this condition implies that this pair live in the bounded family, but in the bounded family, uh, this log canonical threshold, well, especially the generates to the bounded family, but for that, because of the lower semi-continuity and the positivity in bounded family, this number should also be bounded from below. So that's at least expected. So now um, at least I can state uh, my um, first theorem, which um, at least confirms this direction. So, um, and in fact, it can be much more precise than what the conjecture implies. So we can show that there actually exists um, a dimensional constant. So it only depends on the dimension such that um, in the context I just introduced here, um, the log canonical threshold is always bounded below by this multiple of the local volume. Again, this gives uh, another indication that the local volume is a pretty refined invariant. So again, it gives lower bound on the log canonical threshold. All right, so. Um, So maybe one more thing I want to say here is that, um, so on top of this statement, I think perhaps what's more interesting is what goes into the proof itself. So um, I'm not going to say too much details, uh, but the proofs, um, relies on a uniform version. of the classical Izumi inequality. So the classical Izumi inequality says the following, that um, if I have a KLT singularity, okay, so again, I'm going to, uh, just to illustrate the ideas, I'm going to drop um, all the, um, the boundary dividers at the moment, because in the statement that I'm going to introduce, they don't matter too much. So, all right, so I have a KLT singularity. Then the Izumi says that um, if I look at the log canonical threshold of some arbitrary um, Q Cartier boundary divisor, then it's bounded from below by some multiple of um, one over the multiplicity of this divisor D. Right, so for smooth point, this constant C can be just chosen as one. So that's the even more classical statement at a smooth point. Okay, but this C usually depend on the singularity.
However, um, this one over multiplicity, of course, is one way to measure the singularity, but it's not the only way to do that. So if you look at the definition of the Lock canonical threshold, I haven't wrote that down, but now I'm going to write that down. So this is the infimum of the lock discrepancy over the vanishing order of the ambient divisor. And the infimum is taken again over um, all dividers over the singularities. Right, so, so then basically every term on the right-hand side inside this infimum is also a way to measure the singularity. And we can compare this with the lock canonical threshold and see how far they deviate. Um, so now the statement, um, the key ingredient that goes in the proof, into the proofs of the theorem is that, right, so, so again, the lock discrepancy, sorry, the lock canonical threshold is bounded from below by some multiple of um, this lock discrepancy over the vanishing order. Okay, so, and then there's a multiple here, um, just like what we did here for one over multiplicity. But what happens is that, so this multiple can be made pretty, pretty precise. So, so there is a dimensional constant. Uh, um, and at the same time, um, um, oh, sorry. Uh, um, it's going to involve the local volume of the singularity divided by the, um, the normalized volume of that divider. So, uh, right, so I'm not going to fill it up. So, but the normalized volume is the one we used before to define the local volume, right? So it's the log discrepancy to the n times the volume. If you still remember, this is the expression that appear in the interval when we define local volume. Okay, so, um, so in some sense, what we are saying here is that up to this dimensional constant, um, how far this, um, this quotient deviates from the log canonical threshold depends on where the, how far your um, divisor E um, is away from computing the infimum in the local volume. So the reason this, um, this constant that depend on the singularity is that this multiplicity usually is not the valuation or whatsoever that computes the local volume. Um, however, if you choose a divisor that's very close to computing the local volume, then this term is roughly one. Then I get a uniform version of the Izumi inequality where uniform means that the constant now is only depend on the dimension. Okay, so that's, that's roughly what goes into this statement because now in order to compute this log canonical threshold, I want to really choose a valuation that's close, closer to computing this local volume. Um, and then I can basically compare both sides using that valuation. And the difference is some dimensional constant. Right, so um, again, as I said, I don't want to um, go too much in detail into um, the proof because actually it's rather technical, um, but I think that's what I want to say about this thing. Um, are there questions so far? So, so I just missed one uh, one thing. So your uh, the, the proposition was uh, a part of an explanation how you prove the theorem, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what I call this uniform version of Izumi. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, the theorem proves the conjecture which was before the theorem and in a like. In a, in a stronger version. So, so this theorem is like, um, like one thing that you extract from the conjecture, right? So the conjecture implied that um, this log discrepancy, sorry, log canonical threshold should be bounded from below by the volume in a suitable sense. Mm -hmm. And that's what right now I can confirm. Yeah, but I'm going to come back to the conjecture um, very okay. shortly. Um, not a full version, but some version of it. All right, so now let me go back to the conjecture. Um, so, all right, so the conjecture, let me remind you, says that um, when I fix the local volume lower bound, I get special boundedness. Um, but there is, in fact, another way to characterize special boundedness using a local analog of the BAB conjecture. Um, 
So let me define what's this so-called um, ipsilon log canonical singularity. Um, so a singularity will be called um, ipsilon, sorry, ipsilon delta log canonical. Um, if um, first of all, the minimal log discrepancy of the singularity is at least epsilon. And at the same time, there exists a color component. I'll define this very shortly. So E um, sine y over x, right? So, so there's a um, divisor over the singularity um, such that, um, so um, this y comma E is, um, Delta PLT. All right, so um, so there's the statement, but let me explain some of the terms. All right, so color component means that so E is the only exceptional divisor, so minus C sample. Um, and um, this Y comma E is PLT. Okay, so so this is basically how we go from the local. Um, case of the singularity is the global object of final varieties. Yes, these two conditions in particular will imply that um, E together with the correction term that I get from taking a junction. Um, right, so let me write. Um, so KY plus E restricted to E is KE plus this delta, the different. Um, then this E comma delta E will be a log final pair. Right, so, um, and then I'm not going to say what's delta PLT in this case, but, uh, but roughly this condition you can understand as uh, saying that this log final pair, um, the minimal log discrepancy of this log final pair is at least delta. So. I'm sorry, uh, what does the delta PLT mean? Ah, so that's what I just um, trying to um, elaborate. So, um, so, so more precisely, it says that um, the exceptional divisors have discrepancy at least delta. But maybe conceptually, um, it's also somewhat saying that this log final pair um, is delta KLT. So the minimal log discrepancy is at least delta, and that's the condition that appear in Burkhardt's BAP steel. Okay, so for instance, Berka showed that log final pairs with MLT is at least delta, they belong to a bounded band. All right, so, um, so using this notion, um, and based on Berka's theorem, of course, um, so Jingjun Han, uh, Ji Hao Liu, and um, Muraga has shown that, um, so epsilon delta log canonical singularities um, they are specially bound when you fix epsilon delta, of course. Um, okay, so, so fix epsilon and delta. Uh, so again, the idea is that, um, so this condition says that um, over the singularity, I can extract this color component. Um, and Burkhardt's BAB theorem says that this, this log final pair belong to a bounded family. But using this component, I can degenerate the singularity to an orbifold cone over um, this, this component. And the epsilon log canonical condition tells me that the polarization cannot be arbitrarily large. So then I get a bounded family of degenerations. That's the idea. Okay, so, um, so now, um, so inspired in part by this statement, uh, so Jingjun, um, Yu Chen Liu, and Lu Qi um, in their earlier work has proposed a stronger refinement of the, the special boundedness conjecture that I stated earlier. So what they conjecture is that, so this epsilon, um, right, so let me see, let me phrase the conjecture in the following way. Um, so if I fix the dimension, Right, so now we have this lower bound on the local volume that's expected to give special boundedness. And there is also this epsilon log canonical, um, epsilon delta log canonical condition that's also, that already gives special boundedness. 
So what they conjecture is that, so everything in this diagram, they are just equipment. Okay, so, um, so if I know a collection of singularity is um, epsilon delta log canonical, or some positive epsilon and delta, then that's equivalent to saying that the local volume is bounded from below by some other constant, um, by some other positive constant um, that depend on epsilon delta. Okay, so, so and vice conversely, if I have a collection of singularity whose local volume is at least is bounded from below by some number epsilon zero positive, then they are also epsilon delta log canonical for some constant that depend on the local volume. Okay, so that's a refinement of the special boundedness conjecture. Um, but unfortunately, this, this conjecture at the moment seems pretty hard. Um, so, so in that same paper, um, so they proved this, this equivalence um, in dimension two. Uh, so for KLT pairs with a boundary, they proved this in dimension two. For KLT pairs without a boundary, they proved this in dimension three when the singularity is terminal, um, essentially using the classification. Um, and for some technical reason, um, they have to use um, empty boundary rather than arbitrary boundaries. And also in general, if X is already analytically bounded, Um, but only the boundary dividers vary. They can also um, prove this equivalence is true. But yeah, but in general, I think this conjecture at the moment seems pretty hard. Um, so on the other hand, what I can show is that um, if you modify this statement a little bit, then you do get an equivalence. Um, so again, let me fix dimension. Then the theorem is that, uh, okay, so let me copy this statement. Um, is that uh, on the right-hand side, if you also um, add um, put an upper bound on the minimal log discrepancy of color component, um, then the equivalence is true. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what minimum log discrepancy of Clarkson. This MLDK is very shortly, right? So the definition is um, very straightforward. So the rational MLD uh, takes the minimum of log discrepancy among all dividers. Uh, but now I'm going to just take um, the minimum among color components. Okay, because those are really the objects that correspond to final varieties. Uh, but E has to be a color component. All right, so mind you, so this uh, the dividers we can extract as a single exceptional divisor and they are KLT final varieties. Okay, so Another statement is that, um, so in order to get an equivalence, um, um, one way to make it easier is to also put in an upper bound for the minimum of distribution. And actually this is an if and only if. Now, if you still believe the original conjecture, uh, then if you compare um, this one and the theorem, it's natural to expect the following. Right? So the conjecture would be that, um, so of course, the conjecture that this, this condition is redundant. And the reason it should be redundant is that, um, so maybe if whenever there's a local volume, lower bound, then there should be also an upward bound on the minimal log discrepancy. So, and this constant should probably depend on the dimension and on the local volume. And if this is true, then we can get rid of um, this condition. Um, so the last theorem is that, um, so 
Okay, so let me give this conjecture a name. Uh, I didn't label all the conjectures. Maybe this is conjecture A, this is conjecture B. Um, so conjecture B is true, but of course when B is true, then A is also true. Um, so both of um, both holes um, in dimension three. Okay, so at least that gives some evidence. Of course, they, they host for trivial reasons in dimension two, uh, but in dimension two, you have to do a lot of work. Um, okay, so um, now in the last few minutes, um, let me say a few more words about this conjecture B. So, so this conjecture might remind us of something that um, was originally conjectured by Shokarov on the ordinary MLD. So Shokarov, um, conjecture that um, the minimal log discrepancy of any singularity actually is at most dimension. And then you might wonder, all right, so do we really need this local volume lower bound. So, um, so maybe one thing you can conjecture is that actually the minimal log discrepancy of color component is also bounded from above, maybe not by n, but by some dimensional constant. Um, and this seems to be rather tricky. So for instance, I don't know the answer in dimension three. In dimension two, again, it holds for trivial reasons, but in dimension three, it seems very tricky. So, um, so for instance, um, um, let's say, so there are singularities that are so-called weakly special, meaning that they only have one color component. And in those case, this invariant, this minimal log discrepancy Right, so I should explain the notation, right? So this minimal log discrepancy of color component, as you might guess. Um, so for weakly special singularities, um, this minimal log discrepancy is computed by exactly that color component. And one way to construct a weakly special singularity is to take the weakly special final variety. Meaning that, um, so, X comma D for any effective divisor that's Q linearly equivalent to minus K. This is always log canonical for any D. Okay, so for instance, projective space are definitely not in this range. Um, so these are very, rather special. Um, so however, if you take a cone over this um, weekly special final varieties, okay, so for any um, way divisor that's uh, proportional, um, to the anti canonical. Okay, so L is not necessarily cut here because I can take all before cone. Okay, so there's a weight divisor. Then I can take the all before cone over X. Well, this is roughly just, so I'm just taking the direct sum of all the sections of L. Um, right, so then this is a uh, weekly special singularity. And for this one, the MLD of column component is exactly computed by the ordinary block and it's equal to this, this multiple Q. Okay, so, um, so if you believe this conjecture, this should imply, uh, uh, let me call this conjecture C now. Uh, so this should imply that um, um, that the way index of um, of weekly special final varieties is bounded from above by some constant that only involves the dimension. Um, and from the examples that we've known, this seems to be true, but again, I don't know a definite answer at the moment. So if anyone has any ideas, um, feel free to let me know. All right, so I think I'll just stop here. Yes, I'm also out of time.
Um, thanks for the attention. Uh, so, uh, let's thank Jiquan. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any questions at this moment? Maybe uh, uh, I was a bit lost in the sequence of last conjectures. Okay. Can you comment? <laughs> yeah. to, uh, uh, by this moment, you have like two conjectures C, right? So uh, sorry, no. Uh, you. Uh, 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 I would just uh, 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 maybe I am a bit lost in uh, in the use of question marks. Uh, uh, so you have conjecture C about uh, uh, about this special version of minimal log discrepancy. Yes. Computed on core log components, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and the uh, uh, and the last assertion about the uh, whale index. Uh, uh, you claim that it's implied by conjecture C, or you. So if you right, so so conjecture C says that uh, the minimal of log discrepancy of color component is also bounded from above by some dimensional constant. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. As a con maybe I should really call it a question, but if you if you want, you can also call it a conjecture. Uh, now, if you believe this is true then it should imply then you should also believe that the way index of weekly special final varieties is bounded from above by some dimensional constant but so this implication this red implication is also conjectural or yeah it's conjectural it's conjectural. even even the, so uh, the conjecture is conjectural and the implication itself is also conjectural yeah so that's that's the question I, i'm raising yeah, yeah, I see at the moment, I'm I don't have a definite answer to either of these questions. Maybe it's better if I put it as a question. Okay, so mm -hmm. yep. So question. Um, um, and what this means is that um, uh, so another question. Uh, right. So question one, question two, and what happens is that if question one is yes. Then that would imply question two has also has a positive answer. Ah, so the the implication itself is not conjectural, but yeah, only the yeah, yeah. The implication is right. Uh, so, so if you have a positive answer to the second question, that would give uh, some evidence for the first one. I see. Uh, that was that was what I was trying to say. Yeah, but again, as I said, I don't really have. Um, any idea about how to prove any of these two conjectures? The first one definitely would seem very hard. Yes, it already implies Shawcroft's conjecture, in some sense. And uh, and for question one, uh, so your comment is in parentheses about dimension three. So you mean that uh, you you believe that the answer is yes in arbitrary dimension, but you expect that it's accessible only in dimension three. Uh, I, I mean, so I've asked people around, so including my advisor, Janos, uh, and they seem to believe this conjecture, but what's also a little bit embarrassing is that we don't even know how to prove this in dimension three. So I, I don't know. Uh, uh, for instance, um, the answer in dimension three, even. I see. What, what I what I would say. Yeah. So it'd be very interesting if we can find out the answer, even in dimension three. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So I was a little bit fast at the end. Because oh, no, no, no. It's a, yeah, yeah. But kind of time. But it was approximately clear, and now when you when you put uh, put it uh, in, in this way, it it becomes uh, it becomes. Uh, even more clear. So, any further questions? Uh, the last, uh, the last conjecture is it mm -hmm. uh, obvious in the Tory case? How about Tory case? Uh, 
uh, what do you mean? Like, um, just so suppose, in, suppose in, your, your variety is toric. Uh, so, okay, so, um, uh, last conjecture, you mean last, uh, this one? Two. Or? I mean, I mean, question two. Oh, question two. Uh, yeah. But I guess toric varieties will not be weakly special. Never. Because, um, so, right, so, um, so I guess, I mean, weakly special means that, um, so one thing that's implied by weakly special is that it has, um, Finite automorphism. So, so for instance, you cannot wait. Wait. Ah, so um, uh, let me see if there's a more direct way to say uh, why it's not toric. Uh, so. So um, let me see. So I guess maybe it's easier if you um take for instance. So already like the um. The torus invariant divisor um, is um, strictly log canonical. Um, but if you perturb that a little bit, then I, I think you can make some of the coefficient equal to great, become greater than one as a log canonical divisor. So I have to double check the details, but I think that's how one way to show Toric varieties are never weakly special. Mm. Okay. Let me think. Yeah. Well, it looks rather reasonable because so you, uh, I think the combinatorics the one means the following combinatorial thing that you take fn, you take maybe some some hyperplane subdividing the fn into two parts, and then. Uh, this means that uh, the, the linear combination of the invariant devices corresponding to vectors in on, in the right part, so to say, from this hyperplane with small coefficients, small positive coefficients, uh, the sum is linear equivalent to uh, to the sum of invariant devices on the left. Uh -huh. okay, left okay, okay. Small okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe you're yeah. Right. Now you take the standard anti-canonical divisor and. Uh, borrow the small coefficients from some of them and add small coefficients to the other. And this yes. yeah. yeah, but on the other hand, for toric varieties, question one is always true. Because, um, so for toric varieties, we know the answer to Shawcroft's conjecture. And those, and this, and all this can be computed by torus invariant blow ups. And those always give you color components. Mm -hmm. So for varieties, question one is always true, but it's just, we don't know the answer and you don't get examples to question two. So. And what about conjecture? Uh, you had other conjectures, which can be also tested like A and B, for instance, which could be also tested in the toric case. Oh other yeah, so, oh. Right, so in, in the toric case, those are true. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so in dimension three and in the toric case, uh, Um, so, but in the Torah case, so there is also an independent proof given by um, uh, okay, Maranga, um and Eric Seuss, uh, but unfortunately he's not here today. Uh, so. Yeah. so in the Torah case, they also have- Ah, it's exactly, I see, I see. Uh, it's, it's exactly that, that recent paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so there are two proofs in the Toric case. So we, we do this using the minimum log discrepancy of color component, um, and they do this using convex geometry. Mm -hmm. I see. So any further questions? If no, let's thank, thank you very much, Jiquan, once again. Okay. Ah, thank you.